start with the question, who are your cornerstones? It's a kind of metaphor that I come up for when thinking about family, community, and also my livelihood, our livelihood. Um, because we need uh, something as basic as a stone to build an infrastructure, first of all. Um, and of course, soil, earth to begin with. And it's not only one stone. Maybe for some of us, culturally, it could be a few people that you really find that you kind of rely on or you find your inspiration from. Um, but actually, for many of us, it's a lot more than that. It's an entire community and it could even be the Earth. It could be the whole planet, although they might be people you've never met before. The way we go forward in the field, mostly as anthropologists, but as social scientists, we go through by building alliances, slow by slow, one by one. Maybe you don't consider or you don't call them or you don't recognize them as alliances. Maybe you just call them as interlocutors. You call them as key holders, as transcribers. They might be much more than that, much more than what you think or how you position them to be. So building an alliance is also kind of a shift in the way you perceive your engagement in the field. And in order to see the people who you're engaging with, or you're who, who you are working with, or who you are working for, as recognizing them as your allies, as your partners, or a strategic force, in order to be able to have access, or to remain into that particular field site. That could also be your home, not a foreign land always. And in building an alliance, also to, to recognize them as your collaborators, companions, you know, people fall in love in, in these spaces. And all of a sudden, one of these members become their partners, like wives or husbands or lovers, um, or more to that, friends forever, you know, like all these very bonding that happens there. Or you become part of associations, you form coalitions, unions until these alliances can even become movements right so this is nothing new um, but i think to put in that way to frame our engagement in the field as an alliance is valuable for me um, and that you come together not because you're only sharing a common interest but also because you're sharing a common vision and what that vision may be so last Sunday on Valentine's Day, I've seen these ice flowers in Moutier. It just amazed me um, because I've never seen such a thing like that. And I thought it could work great as a metaphor to my stones in addition with the plants and the river and the ice. Like this kind of magic is everywhere, but you're only able to see and recognize when you really open yourself to the different and that's kind of getting out from your own doctrination um, so i find in order to build alliances one really needs to be co-creative because that's only when you are able to mobilize people in such a common vision and that's when you also when you see them as your partners that's when you actually have them as your co-ethnographers co-creators co-researchers and co-authors like I was saying before, moving beyond staging, positioning these people as interlocutors, key holders, research, research assistants, or just research participants. And how do you actually go beyond hierarchies of power, status, and overcome these financial disparities that are based on ex extractivism, extracting knowledge without actually acknowledging the source? So co-creation means an ontological shift in the mindset that kind of uh, pushes and inspires one to a more holistic approach of creation. And that's when you start seeing the new things you've never seen before. And I think that's the beauty of uh, such discovery. And so as I was walking and seeing this uh, beautiful ice flowers that have shaped with interesting coincidences of the climate, 
it was probably the coldest day in Switzerland last Sunday and Saturday. And then I've seen this magical thing. I was meant to be there um, as part of this wider consciousness that goes beyond me. And then you zoom in, you see the details of the beautiful snow particles. And then you see these funny figures who are dancing uh, like little ghosts or whatever your imagination. Water that is kind of moving, flowing, but also there's this frozen structure. It's just magic. It's, it's just like creating this incredible magic. And then you see this frozen uh, waterfall, but still some of the water is going. So it kind of inspires you to think not only in terms of words, but also how you kind of use the visuals in the way you think and narrate. So multimodal media engagement. So I had, you know, building alliances, co-creation. Why is it wonderful to co-create? Because you can see the new in a different eye. And then there comes the multimodal media engagements. What do I mean by that? Um, well, for me, it's actually, it has a purpose for why I'm using multimodal media or I'm defining it as because visual anthropology actually as a visual anthropologist I've always talked about visual anthropology and different methods um, but I realized the need to also kind of go a little bit beyond into the interdisciplinary where visual anthropology with me methods sometimes can stay uh, very traditional in the sense like you know, there are some still some strict boundaries of what is anthropology and not. And I find that very tiring as a discussion because it's already been 10 years and still we couldn't come to an agreement of what is anthropology and what is not anthropological. Uh, as you see in most of the, you know, introduction to visual anthropology courses. So I said, okay, let's have a fresh air, not to say, not to replace visual anthropology with multimodal modality, but to kind of open a little bit of the scope, enlarge what is meant by that. And it's actually a very interdisciplinary engagement um, because it requires you to go to move beyond your anthropological circuit and collaborate with artists, with activists, advocates, which visual anthropologists and social anthropologists do that too, not to say they don't do that. Um, but for me, the reasons why I opted has the intention to visibilize often what is gone invisible. Um, I'm interested in theories that are supportive of transformation and what I mean by that is uh, transformation for social justice. So I have a very particular interest in why I'm interested in scholarship and uh, I find it very depressing when I need to terrorize for journals that nobody's going to read. And it's just going to be staying in, you know, this very elite readership. And that is a language that kind of uh, keeps you a little bit restricted. That's why uh, I call this crack the wall, you know, the wall of written, uh, actually, the wall of the Anglo-Saxon English journal, uh, the very restrictive because I'm not, a, I'm not a native English speaker and I also have to write and think in terms of theories through Western epistemologies and ontologies on the top of it with a language that I was not born into. And so kind of multimodality gave me a space where I could communicate and think of representation more than just one language. Um, and this is going beyond this having a bit more of a literate approach into the diverse forms of how one could actually question about the changes in society more and more in relation to also new media and technologies. So multimodal could be all of these things, you know, today, uh, social media posts, anthropologists are studying Instagram, looking at Facebook, what is it doing to the world, website creations together with the communities you're working with, so it's not always um, the information you get is from a sound record or a videotape, but it could also be like when you sit together doing a website together, 
uh, with the community who's interested in selling their products and you're kind of helping them and at the same time you're learning about their ethnobotanical ethnobotanical knowledge so that's one thing infographics you could be uh, looking in a business environment and you can see how people are tirelessly producing these infographics to accelerate income to their companies and why is this is such a very strong language now in the corporate world and i'm wondering why uh is an infographic an important place to look at maybe or to look through with animations, illustrations, painting, poetry, music, theater, soundscapes, you know, which, you know, it's a, it's a strong discipline itself, ethnomusicology, but um, it might not always be in that depth, but still uh, there is value in the soundscapes that you might be interested in capturing or navigating. And of course, augmented reality, it's a field of computing, but also there are the anthropology of computing as well. So what is your talent? What is the hidden gem that is inside of you? Could you be maybe interested in performance or dance? So how would you uh, communicate that aside to just writing about how you are terrorizing on them? And here are a few examples of the alliances that I'm involved with. Karma Motion is our collective uh, visual anthropology house where we do documentary films. And here, uh, again, this is my collective and where we are producing stories uh, with all these people. And you can see the way I kind of integrated their bios are also a little bit in, in a funny way. For instance, Mehmet Turke, the major collaborator whom we did the film on his life and traditions of regener regenerative farming practice. The way we called himself was he's a troglodyte, meaning a cave dweller, a pigeon lover, vineyard keeper. So all the things that, you know, uh, makes us human in the way, in our interests and what we like and dislike. And also then explaining where people come from we just added in what are the languages we speak. So he's speaking French, Turkish, English, Ramamani, an expert of transitional justice. She speaks French, English, Hindi, Tamil. And you can see also a little bit of the, um, how French, English are actually a bit like everywhere. And then you have all of a sudden this Tibetan, then Turkish. It's very helpful to find other means than just having to speak in one typical language and you know media is also a form of language it's kind of a transnational language i would say uh, that feeds into each other and not to say you know why do we have to speak french english everywhere but how does that actually we find the avenues to kind of co-create in um, a medium that you don't just always need to express in this western languages i, I that's what i want to say actually so we have a Tibetan doctor also, Amchi Karmachodon, who we made the film Amchi. And the Aitata family and the Sarikechili family, a mobile pastoralist tribe. And then kind of listing all the festival recognitions. And this is all in purpose, like why I kind of chose to make this extravagant website, uh, because I know that it's kind of empowering to the communities. Uh, to their causes. And this is also what I mean by uh, coming up with a, you know, alliance of people redistributing the recognition that comes from, you know. So you see, this is our Ethnokino. It's a collective of barren based anthropologists and it's open for everyone to take part in. Uh, we are screening the latest visual anthropology films as well as you know documentary films and we have this format called Ethnokino Shorts where we kind of try to nurture emerging young talents and it's a non-competitive format uh, nothing is into competition everything is about giving visibility to the less known worlds for instance this program that we've done last um, season had to do with languages least represented so 
the first film uh, is shot in the Aitata in the Tamazic language, Rituals of Resistance is it in Tibetan. Um, Edge of the Knife is with the Haida language from the Canadian. There's only like 20 people left speaking that language and they've made this incredible film, the first future film on the Haida. And this platform really helps us open things into discussion, going outside the you know, typical classroom format into discussing anthropology through films. And also, um, we are now interested in going beyond films, make it more interactive with different forms. And um, yeah, so for me, multimodality also allows one to kind of cooperativize knowledge production and therefore see knowledge as the commons. Um, and uh, it's an interconnected world where knowledge is accessible, should be accessible for all, where everybody should be able to participate they should be recognized for their knowledge co-creation. Um, this should also bring invisibility to their cases and causes. And this, this should also provoke transformation. And by doing that, actually, we would be unraveling the death matter of our scholarship and bring back life to the soil, uh, like an earthworm. So you can see the little earthworm here. Um, that's all. So thank you for listening to me. If you're interested in collaborating and well, you, you know me, most of you know me. So now I stop here. Word of gratefulness. Thank you, Ada, for having encapsulated so much of what is important to us for the future of anthropology in such a beautiful and short presentation. I was listening very carefully. I just came back from the dental training and was a bit stretching out while listening to you. And maybe Ada, uh, I have one question about uh, the power um, asymmetry that you just mentioned. And I would, I would like to listen to you. How do you concretely achieve this asymmetry in your, uh, in your well, you know, um, for me, it's very uh, explorative, you know, always this issue with the power, with hierarchy and the asymmetries. And all I'm trying to do is, uh, okay, first thing that I wanted to break through from was this having to publish in a journal where, you know, only my colleagues would be able to uh, enjoy. And I found that a bit less stimulating, you know, like most of you. And uh, I wanted to be more transparent and I wanted that this becomes a partnership with whomever I'm collaborating with. It could be a, a person who's never seen a computer to a person who is so knowledgeable in everything, but it just doesn't have the uh, recognized institutional access to perhaps apply to these funds, right? So how do you cooperativize? How do you recognize? how do you kind of bring in this recognition outside from this bubble that we're a little bit stuck in and we are all kind of crying to uh, reach out. Thank you, Eda. It was a beautiful presentation. And um, I kept on, as you showed more and more, I kept on thinking of the word decolonizing, that there was so much in what you were framing that would that is a, such a huge contribution to a decolonizing methodology. Uh, which is becoming vital in more and more places in the world. And just speaking from my experience, I've been working on a big research proposal. This also speaks to um, Laurie's comment, where right from the very in in um, a big pan Pacific research proposal, where we've written into the project the making of an ethnographic film, and a PhD for a student to produce um, art pieces that will that will be both orienting but emerge it out of the research on medical trust. There's a big issue of medical trust in the Pacific that relates to particularly diabetes, other people having their limbs amputated because they don't trust doctors and all kinds of traditional healers. And so there's a big pan Pacific project that we're involved in, but the multimodality part is, is in the past would be seen as maybe peripheral as part of communicating research findings, 
but now is seen as central to building trust with communities, creating outputs that are relevant to those communities, uh, um, and building these alliances that Edda frames so beautifully. Because research that's trusting research has to be one where there's a common purpose. And there's one thing that many based in Auckland and Australia is that there has to be community benefit from all research. And so if you want community benefit from research, then, then, then the list of strategies that are open to you, many of them would be multimodal ones that Edda is, is framing. Accessibility, uh, nine-year-olds and below, um, uh, possible engagement, possible sharing. These things have to be able to be shared and be used by a community. And as many of us experience, uh, you know, a publication, the American Ethnologist, is of no value whatsoever to community, except, except perhaps if you are a member of the community and you can be celebrated for doing so well to get a publication in, in a journal like that, <laughs> then, then there's a value, but there's no real tangible value. So, And then there is Inaj, who's actually a practicing visual anthropologist and is my filming partner and the co-founder of Karma Motion, my, uh, the Alliance example I was giving. And um, just recently with him, when we were filming in the High Atlas, we had these questions all over our mind. You know, we are there, these privileged people with our cameras, and we were trying to kind of come up with some um, excuses, I would say, to say what we're doing is good for humanity. You know, still today, I, I feel like me and Inanj has unresolved issues around that, but we still made the film uh, because we thought if we don't communicate what the transhumans in the high atlas are going through with the recent uh, water shortages with climate change, how will these people survive? So we felt like there could still be something that the media could mediate in terms of livelihood support. And so we are working with NGOs, foundations that are currently active, trying to bring in livelihood support, but not in a humanitarian aid way, in a way where it's participatory co-creative. So it's a constant negotiation, a constant struggle. Um, I can't say like we're hundred percent ethical. I think for us to be able to say that we should just all stop everything and become farmers. I still believe in that and just, you know, mind our own business. But still, I mean, we are also as lone people, like as individuals, we can't survive. So this also doesn't mean, like, I don't have all the answers, no? but maybe Inanj, I can invite you to say a few words also how you find with Claire's question about, you know, how we deal with power asymmetries as practicing anthropologists using multimodal, um, medium if you're there in lunch hi do you hear me yes okay um yeah I, um, my video is off uh, normally because of low internet speed so i hope you can hear me properly uh i totally agree with the leaf in terms of um having these um, our privileged position when we are um, doing any field work and it's in a way disturbing because when you see how the people are struggling the people that are hosting you even like um, sharing the, the, the little things that they have with you and you're there with uh, all this funding and expensive equipment and uh, with the expectation from them that you kind of help is is quite disturbing and our hope uh, with Elif is that uh, whatever we do ends up bringing something positive to the to the communities that we work with and it's not easy to to guess how it's going to happen but um, we are hoping the films that we, we make can change people's minds the photographs the stories we share can um, create some kind of awareness uh, in the right places and this is actually the last thing that we had a discussion with the organizers with the NGO um, that we are working with. All the members there 
we sat down and we discussed how can we make sure this film makes an impact at the end that is not just a um, a kind of adventure for me and a leaf to go and um, experience his life but how can we bring something back to the people at the end and uh, the our friends at the ngo they reassured us that they at least they are working in the background right now even if covid is um cancelling many of our plans they are uh, coming up with new ideas and they will they will um come back to us with some new initiatives and they're already doing this uh, as an NGO unrelated to just our work but uh, as the work that they are doing in terms of social change bringing uh, participatory research to the communities we are just there with our cameras to show only a brief part of this and hopefully um, we will come back to you with some new news eventually uh, once uh, COVID is kind of giving us more flexibility to to go back to the community and see how, how else we can uh, bring more change to, to the people we work with. Thanks, Inanj. So nice to see you. And Inanj is in Cyprus. Tschüssli, tschüssli, müsli. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.